Welcome to anyone who is joining us. Um, today's Tech Talk is Human-Centered Design Research, exploring the intersection of research and design with Dr. Derek Hansen. And Derek, we'll, we'll turn it over to you. All right, great. I'm happy to be here. Um, I joined the electrical and computer engineering department a year ago when the IT and cybersecurity program merged. And it's been a great year and um, I'm thrilled to be with my new colleagues and uh, to have this opportunity to present. So my background is um, in human computer interaction. I got a PhD in information, um, which sounds pretty general, but it was kind of um, from the University of Michigan, who has a program focused on kind of the new information um, knowledge economy that we're in. And so um, it was a blend of economics, computer science, and information science. Um, after that, I went to the University of Maryland and taught in their iSchool for four years, and then came out here to BYU, and I've been here over 12 years now. This is my family. I've got um, five children and, and our dog there in the corner. And you can uh, learn more about some of my projects at the website links shown there. So I wanna talk for a minute about research design and the intersection of those. So research is the creative and systematic work undertaken in order to increase the stock of knowledge. And often we talk about research as um, you know generating new kind of generalizable insights about the world. Meanwhile, design is the ability to imagine that which does not yet exist to make it appear in concrete form as a new purposeful addition to the real world. And um, what's interesting about design is that it is um, often grounded in the details of the here and now, um, whereas, research is trying to generalize above those. Um, Human-centered computing, which is the field that I'm a part of, is the interdisciplinary science of designing computational artifacts that better support human endeavors. So we care very much about humans and computers. Um, Herbert Simon, who's one of my favorite um, early thinkers in the field of computing, differentiated between the natural sciences and the artificial sciences. So for the natural sciences, um, things you could think about um, the physical sciences, but also things like psychology, um, they're trying to discover truths about the world. So they might discover the laws of gravity or, um, or they might understand how the brain works, um, but they're trying to describe what exists already. The artificial sciences, which was the domain that Herbert Simon was very interested in, um, is really about trying to design solutions to attain goals. And the word artificial here, he means really human, having to do with humans um, and, and creating things. So it's about what things should be like, not just how they are. And you know, it's value-laden, and we're really interested in um, the validity of the impact of your designs. And so artificial sciences range from the field of economics to organizational behavior to branches of psychology that might be interested in actually um, creating solutions. And then within the technology field, things like human computer interaction, where we're trying to design technologies that help us um, attain certain goals. And certainly a lot of engineering can be um, you know, engineering itself is kind of seen as, as um, artificial sciences because it deals with things that we are creating to achieve goals. So research and experimental development is a field that's recognized, um, especially by engineers. And this is really, you know, creative systematic work to increase the stock of knowledge, including maybe knowledge about humans, cultures, and society, artificial, you know, kind of science things. Um, as well as to devise new applications of available knowledge. In other words, applying things to develop um, tools. And so often when we talk about what are the skills needed in research and experimental development, we talk about um, creating things that are novel, that are you know, creative. It's an uncertain landscape. Um, 
We have to be systematic in the ways that we approach these things. And there's a big question about how transferable or reproducible certain designs are. So we might think about where does knowledge reside? Um, there's theories that we have to describe either human behavior or physical laws. Um, like you see here, you know, e equals mc squared. It's a, a theory that um, represents some universal truth or um, in, in general, we're looking for you know, kind of widely applicable insights. In contrast, we might have a particular artifact. So we have, say, an iPhone that is grounded in the here and now and is meant to meet the needs of people, you know, at this current time and place. And these two things can sometimes come in conflict. So um, we have goals in research to generate generalizable knowledge in design, it's often specific solutions that meet the needs of a particular population in a specific context. Um, often results for research are abstract, whereas design is often highly situated. And then we think about research having long-term you know, impacts in design, sometimes um, has short-term impacts and that's okay. And then with outcomes, we have theory versus some realization of um, concepts in the form of an artifact. Um, there's a nice book, The Design Way, that um, explores some of these um, kind of contradictions or um, you know, concerns. And so this graphic captures some of the ideas here, where on the y-axis we have an increasing level of abstraction. Um, and on the x-axis we have this um, level of complexity and as you um, can see here, we have this graph where we might have you know, universal theories that research is driving at on the upper left quadrant. And down in the right, we have what is sometimes called by designers the ultimate particular, which would be um, designs that meet the needs of the you know, specific nuanced complex environment that you're in. And there's research contributions to be made all along this continuum. Um, but I think it's useful to kind of think about where you are on the continuum if you're interested in performing research in these areas. So what does human-centered design research look like? Um, I'm gonna go through three different kinds of approaches for the intersection of how research and design can interact. And so this first one, uh, we could think of with the keyword for here, research for design, or we might say research for designers. And in the graphic here, you could imagine some researchers that will come up with some key findings um, by using various methods that will inform designers so that designers can then create the artifact more, um, you know, in a better way. And this is human-centered focused because we're trying to, you know, create insights that will help designers. So um, often we mine research from other disciplines. So um, in particular, in human-centered computing, we look at social science theories. So for example, we might find some theories in social science about what motivates people. And we might have some system. So when I was in graduate school, I interacted with the people um, designing a tool that would help you rate movies and then get personalized um, ratings based off of a recommender system back when those were brand new. And they found some findings that if you can emphasize how someone is unique and that their contribution is unique, that might motivate them. But other theories said, oh, you should you know, motivate people by self-interest. And so you can tell them their ratings will improve if you do that. Uh, versus we really need you to do this because you're uniquely qualified based on the movies you've already seen. So you can sort of come up with competing um, theoretical frameworks for what might be useful in a given context, but then you, know, you present those in a way to designers that then they can implement these or run experiments that will help inform the design of the actual thing. So in this case, what they did was they ran studies where they sent different messages to different people randomized. Some of them emphasized 
you know, you're uniquely qualified to rate movies and it'll improve the system because of that. And others, if you rate more movies, you'll get better results. And then you can watch and see what happens. And in this case, the unique emphasis got more people to respond to it. So that informs designers on how they can then improve their socio-technical system that they're designing, in this case, a movie recommendation engine. Um, so the point is here, you know, we can look at research for design. And I have some questions up at the top that are kind of key questions if you're doing this kind of research. So, you know, how can a theory be instantiated into um, artifacts? Or how can you present theory in ways to designers that's useful um, for them to actually inspire new artifacts? Um, what design methods might we, might we use or, or techniques? And an example of, I've, I've pulled up a few examples from my research that just kind of illustrate, you know, contributions in this space and some are modest and some are maybe more significant. But um, this was some work that I did where we wanted to understand how you could develop um, educational simulations uh, that were related to municipal cybersecurity. So there's been a lot of different cybersecurity attacks on city infrastructure um, and government. And so we interviewed a bunch of experts. And so our research stage was really just a bunch of interviews with experts in this domain. And then we organized that material in ways that would be useful for designers of these simulations. So for, for example, here we've identified the key learning outcomes, which we sort of synthesized from a bunch of interviews um, that people that do this kind of work every day um, you know, identified. We also had other things um, related to the situations you might want to model in these, in these simulations. Uh, but again, the point here is we're doing research for designers. So the output of this research is supposed to help designers. Another example, for a few years, we had an NSF grant looking at designing what are called alternate reality games. These are games that play out in the real world. So you might get text messages from characters in an unfolding story, and these play out for years. So we actually got to work with NASA on a game called Dust um, and with the Computer History Museum on a game called the Tessera. And we developed a framework, the uh, Maquette Education ARG Design Framework, that sort of describes and visually represents how you can integrate um, different components when you're designing these alternate reality games or other narrative-based um, experiences with um, large groups of people that, that play educational games. And I won't get into the details of it, but the point is we did, we studied sort of how people design these things and we did some participatory design ourselves, and then sort of looked at, okay, here's a framework that can help designers. So a different way of approaching human-centered computing would be instead of research for design, we might do research into design. And so here we see that we have the researchers who are studying how designers create artifacts. And then we have our research findings that um, you know, describe that. And so we're looking at researchers um, or, or rather, we're researching the processes and tools that designers use um, and the artifacts they create. So we might be asking questions like, what does this design space look like? Are there gaps in the design space? Or what practices do designers implement in this kind of space? So an example study that I haven't done, but I, you know, people are, are doing this kind of work. I run our mixed reality lab, so we're interested in um, augmented uh, reality as well as uh, virtual reality. And people are starting now to do design work inside of VR, but we don't really know how well VR um, supports that kind of work. And so you could imagine a study where you would study a bunch of people in a VR context that are trying to maybe design new automobile, you know, um, you know, components or something like that. And then we would watch them, learn what they do, look at the detailed nuances of how they collaborate in that space, how they um, use the affordances of that space uh, to design differently than they do um, not in VR. 
And also what are the challenges that emerge from that? So that would be an example of research into design. And then your findings will often inform designers, um, but maybe others as well, just um, about this design processes. So here's an example of some work that I did. I, I worked for years on a product called Node Excel, where um, we've designed and used and studied how people use this social networking tool. So the tool Node Excel lets you take data from social media sites like Twitter or now X um, or Facebook or um, YouTube, and you can import data and then look at the relationships between say people um, or user accounts rather on X and how you know people interact with each other or the interactions between videos and which ones are um, recommended other ones or are similar or you know things like that. So we studied how people used um, Node Excel and came up with a conceptual framework here that or a process model that helps um, understand and capture how people do social network analysis work. And this then can help inspire new designs and new feature sets um, that require a deep understanding of how people perform social network analysis. Um, so for example, here, the one of the key insights that we sort of capture in a paper and describe this is that um, network visualization and the metrics that you get from social network analysis if you can closely couple those then and let people play with these dynamically, then it allows them to analyze things in, in ways that are better than if you do those separately, which a lot of systems before Node Excel came along would do. It was like you could spit up a, a static visualization, but you couldn't you know, dynamically interact with that in the metrics. But in this one, you could, and that led to new ways of interpreting data that were dynamic. But again, the example here is we're really doing, we're, we're studying researchers and we're doing design, you know, into research. Another example here, we didn't study people, we studied artifacts. So this was a study where we were interested in looking at games that motivated people to um, walk more. So these all had step counter um, data that they would use. And we were interested in exploring the design space of what exists. And so we actually did a little bit of network um, analysis where we, we connect different features. And so you can see these thick lines connecting challenges, competition, and social influence. That would mean there's a lot of apps that share all three of those um, characteristics or, or apps that share challenges and social influence and other apps that share competition and social influence. In the end, we, um, we've found those would be examples like, I don't know, Fitbit where it's got this like, you know, challenge to, you know, who walks the most this weekend. There's a competition element to that and social influence by sharing who, um, who else, you know, has uh, step, taken more steps than you. In contrast, you can notice like there's other kind of missing lines. So there's not many things where we have um, collaboration, but a narrative or a plot. We didn't really find um, games that did that. And in this case, we were interested in creating a game um, that would leverage that. So the Eureka Trail is a game that we've worked on that um, sort of a mashup between the Oregon Trail and a competitive step count type thing. So you have to complete challenges. And as you do that, um, you survive the trek west. Um, so in any event, this is an example, again, of a study of research artifacts that looks at the designs that have been completed and might inspire new designs or help us better understand the landscape. So the final type of research that I could talk about is research through design. This is personally my favorite kind of research. Um, this is where the designers and the researchers sort of collaborate together and there's different ways they might collaborate, but they actually work together to create artifacts, but to also document that process much more rigorously than you normally would. And then that um, can inform research. So we're looking at, um, at, you know, how can we, I don't know, achieve certain goals or embed certain values into artifacts? And then do those artifacts have the desired outcomes that we care about? 
So for this one, we get to invent stuff. And if we're researchers, that's kind of fun. And we often partner with others who are experts at building things. Um, so an example here, this was a fun paper that I um, worked on with Amanda Hughes, who's a faculty member um, now in the CS department at BYU. We were imagining um, what would it be like to um, support or how can we support social interaction that's meaningful um, with people who have a forced delay or have an extended latency. So the dramatic example, this would be imagine people living on Mars and people living on the earth and you have a forced latency of, you know, say 20 minutes. Um, so you can't like have a Zoom call and talk with them. Um, there's other examples where, you know, maybe people go into, uh, in cybersecurity, you might work in a skiff. And so you, you know, you can come out for a lunch break, but while you're in there, you can't talk to anyone and can't have an experience. Um, or maybe people that work out on, you know, in places where they have no reception and want to stay connected, you know, periodically um, when they can check in after some period of latency. So here um, we were interested, what we did was we had a, a group of students and we brought in some other experts and we took a semester long class and we designed um, both a conceptual framework to think about this. So that would be research for designers, but we also did some design work. So we um, have a couple examples here. We, we Using this framework, we came up with these little cards you can see in the picture and that shows um, and then we gave people design tasks and challenges to try to do things. And then our team itself kind of pursued three ideas we really liked throughout the semester and designed just prototypes of them. We didn't have fully working systems. Um, one of them um, show, is shown in this kind of mobile app where it says, do something. And the idea here is that you could um, you could both do something at the same time, even though you can't see the other person doing it at the same time. So for example, we could um, say dance to the same song that we agree on ahead of time at the same moment. And then in 20 minutes, we get a video of both of us side by side dancing to the same song, um, which we were doing in real time at the same time. But of course um, we didn't know that until we got that video, right? Um, or you might do things like layer activities where I would send maybe a guitar um, piece that I write to you, and then you could add another layer on top of that, of the vocals and, you know, go back and forth. So um, and in any event, we came up with different kinds of um, designs that would let us do that. The other one here, this choose a trigger. The idea here is that I could sort of preset some messages so that if I'm on Mars, let's say, my wife is at home, she could open the fridge. And when she opens the fridge, then it might have an audio clip for me play something that says, hey, have a good morning, um, you know, or, or something like that. And we would imagine different triggers you could have. So those were um, just two of the, you know, kind of ideas that we had that came out of that paper. But again, we learned from actually designing. And this framework that we came up with was actually really informed by the challenges we were bumping into as we tried to design these things and the feedback we were getting. And then um, another example that's more recent, um, we there's a PhD student in mechanical engineering that I worked with a, a little bit, and he did his work on, um, and published this paper on microstructure design um, using a human computational game. And so the idea here is he developed this kind of interactive puzzle solving game in um, that had you move around these 3D kind of network diagrams that represented um, microstructures. And so he had some machine learning algorithms that could give you sort of local optimum so you could get a little feedback when you moved things around. Um, but the system, um, required some human input and, and because of the visual way it was presented, you could often solve things better than just throwing an AI at it. And so um, it was kind of, a, a, again, an example of like it, a new invention that was a socio-technical invention, right? This like human and AI augmented system that could perform better than just the humans or just the AI alone. And so um, often in this kind of work, we're inventing new things 
that sort of combine people and humans as they do things and studying like, look, now this is a new possible way of um, optimizing. And I've done a lot of work in this area. A lot of it you know, has to do with games, which are kind of fun or mobile apps. I tend to try to do things that relate to some sort of real world impact that might improve people's lives. And so uh, most of the games I've done have been educational games. So the Tessera, we have these inventor cards that we made, but then there was a whole online thing that ran in 2017 and, and escaped the museum exhibit at the Computer History Museum, um, where we were interested in exploring some of these new techniques that could be used for educational purposes, where we sort of blend the real world into the fictional world. Um, Dust was a similar one where we had um, students that would pretend like, um, well, we had this narrative that this asteroid came um, from outer space and had some microbes that sort of spread around the world and all the adults collapsed and the teenagers had to rise up and solve problems. So even though the narrative was sort of fanciful, the actual tasks that we had them doing were quite realistic. So they would use a mobile scanner to collect microbes. So that was a little fictional. But once they collected those, they could perform experiments on them. And they, we had an online system where they could like increase the salinity or the um, temperature of different things and find out what conditions this alien microbe would survive in or not. Um, and they could also find, they also did an experiment where they, they um, explored transit data of planets going around um, the suns and or different stars and then would identify likely candidates for where this thing came from and so anyway um though in in all of those we were doing the research part of it was really trying to understand what are the limitations and opportunities of these new genres of kind of gameplay in this case um some other work i've done like the veiled viral marketing project we were looking at how people could use social networks with um, a layer of, of um, anonymity. And so you might get a message that says, one of your friends thinks it might you know, be useful to learn, or one of your friends who wants to remain anonymous um, thinks it might be useful um, you know, for you to learn about the new HPV vaccine or something where perhaps there's people that um, for stigmatized illnesses, they, there might be concern about people sharing things otherwise. Um, we've also done some work on citizen science projects. So this um, flora caching app, this was a, a project a while ago that we worked on where you would check in at different um, plants and report plant phenology data. So how are the plants, um, like how soon do the leaves fall off and things like that. And then scientists would use that data. In our case, uh, we were interested in, um, we did some work on how can you prototype location-based games and apps. Back, This was back before things like Pokemon Go had come out. So in any event, um, this is the kind of work that I think is exciting. And you know, there's lots of really fun um, opportunities to, uh, leverage human skills or motivate people or, you know, help organize uh, behavior to accomplish interesting things. And in the, the field of, you know, hu human computer interaction or, um, you know, the related fields, there's lots of interesting ways to study that systematically so we can make some generalizable insights or design tools that can then aid designers as they go about this sort of work. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up my presentation. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate this and um, we will close for now. And thanks for joining us, everyone.